Is it track? So I saw the chat. Um, Hello, all. Can everybody hear us out there? Type a few words in the chat box if you can hear us. Crystal, Debbie, Dylan, Ginger, Greg Swiker, nice to see you. Doing the questions. Jeff Turner, Julia. Karen, Kevin, Cheryl, been on here for about 30 minutes now. <laughs> okay. Kristen's with us. She's in the other room. I'm actually in Charleston, South Carolina today um, at the publisher's office, and we're going to be working with these guys a little bit tomorrow doing this webinar today. So good to have everybody join us. A few more people still coming in. We've got about one more minute until we launch this bad boy. Now the number counts. The now they're coming in. Yes, perfect. All right, awesome. All right, so 11.30 Central Time. Let's go ahead and get started, guys. I uh, appreciate everybody being here. One of the things that we wanted to do always with Petra is make sure that we're bringing additional learning to the table for um, all of our members and the teams within those members. Um, in the past, you've seen us. We've had you know, Coach Rob with Greg Crabtree talking about LER. Um, a few months ago, we had Heidi Hanna managing stress, and then today we have another kind of friend of Petra, uh, Charles R. Scott, with us today. So I'm going to take too much of his time. I want to make sure we jump in and we can you know, get as much as we can from Charles over the next hour or so. Uh, logistically, if you've got a question about something, he's going to be monitoring the question box. So just type that in, and, and he'll take it from here. We met what Charles, really, we've known, known about each other for a while. When, when did we first meet? We met in person in December. Uh, first time in yeah. December in person. Yeah, but I heard about you over a year earlier and started kind of tracking you and decided I got to meet this guy. <laughs> yeah, we at, we spoke at a nerve event or a, an EO event, um, and people were coming up and telling me about it because of the you know the, the bike track across Japan, etc. And the challenge was I was speaking in another room and you were speaking in the opposite room, so we didn't get to see each other actually you know do our thing. Um, but we spent a couple hours chatting on the couch and got really inspired by this guy and I wanted to make sure that we were able to bring him to And I love your message about grit. I think that's something that's missing today and, and we, we don't focus enough on it. So uh, I'm going to let you jump in. Value of discomfort. Walk us through what you're going to do today and, and any questions that pop in, we'll moderate that from our side. But So welcome to the webinar everybody and welcome uh, Charles. Great. Thank you Andy. I really appreciate the invitation. And I also want to say thanks to Kate for all the, the help uh, organizing this as well. So you guys have been great to work with. And I, uh, you know, it's a real honor to present to this group. And I, I mentioned I heard about Andy and Petra Coach and what, what uh, the, the work that you were doing. And I just started following you. I got on the email distribution list and I would read the blog posts. And I said, this is just a really interesting person and I like the way you think. And then eventually, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, but I live in New York City. And this past December, I was back home to visit family for the holidays and, and called Andy up and said, do you mind if I just swing by and, and meet you in person? And, and it's led to this. When, when I left that meeting, I left Andy's house, he handed me this manuscript of a book he's writing. And the book is, uh, is No Try, Only Do, uh, which is perfect, of course. And I, I read it. This, it's a manuscript. It's not even out yet. So keep your eyes out when it's ready. Uh, it's a very interesting read. And there were a couple of points I noted down here that I found quite interesting. I want to say at the beginning before we dive in. One with Andy, your own transformation from, quote, your self-described term dictator to a leader who uh, listens first and is intent on constantly learning. And this webinar is, is, you know, is indicative of that orientation. I really I like that a lot. 
I think many of us have gone through that same process. It's kind of a maturation process, and it takes a long time to learn sometimes. So that was a key point. And then how much the perseverance is necessary to grow a business. And I'll talk a lot in this webinar about perseverance in the context of, of discomfort and the naysayers who enter our lives and are inside our own brains uh, that when we're trying something really hard uh, and trying to grow. And then the power of establishing and offering trust and the importance of integrity. And that is the cornerstone, I think, for all business success it really is. And you'll see examples that go against that. But, uh, I think the fundamental approach uh, that we take in business is one of integrity, and, and Andy, I think you exhibit that. So, so this workshop is based on something I developed over three years ago. I worked for 14 years at Intel Corporation. I was in the venture capital group. I did a lot of different things. And then I left the corporate world and became an adventurer. And I'll tell a little bit of that story in, in this webinar. But what I did is I developed a, a three-hour workshop for CEOs. And I've delivered this to over 1,000 CEOs across the US and Canada. And this webinar is a subset of the material that I developed. The title of the workshop is, What do you want to be when you grow up? And so I'm engaging CEOs in this question. And I tell them right up front, the, the answer isn't a single title. It isn't a single profession. The answer to this question, what do you want to be when you grow up, is the work of a lifetime. You never stop asking yourself that question. It's relevant until you take your last breath. And it gets more nuanced and more complex as we go through the various phases of life. And what I'm trying to do in, in that workshop for CEOs and in this webinar is encourage you to think about just why do you do the things you do? And in what way can you add vitality and energy to your life and channel that? So you all should have received in advance of this a questionnaire that I send out. And you can, uh, if you've already answered it, great, or you're welcome to answer them as I'm speaking. But in that questionnaire, this is what I use for the CEOs who come up to me afterwards. And this is what happens regularly. I'll give this three-hour workshop. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I have all this interaction back and forth. And then a CEO will come up with me to me afterward and say, I really liked what you had to say. You know, if you hear an interesting speaker, you forget a lot of the material within a couple of days and a few weeks go by and, and you just kind of move on to your life. But if you really want to take these principles and apply them to your life in a way that's like a practice, it's helpful to work with people. And so they'll ask me, you know, will you work with me? And I developed this questionnaire to vet those people and to get a baseline for does it make sense to work together and what are the issues you're, you're struggling with. So fill out the, answer, uh, the questionnaire if you want and then it's a diagnostic tool. If you want me to go through it with you and give you my diagnosis of you <laughs> based on this exchanges I've had with lots of other CEOs, I'm happy to do it and I've set up uh, 10 30-minute slots this afternoon and tomorrow morning where I can where I will do that. And so it, just send a note to, to Kate, and she's listed as um, well, aligned today as the organizer, and, um, and she'll, she can do it. So it's first come, first serve. So as I'm speaking, if you, you think, yeah, this makes sense, then go, go for it. And I'm happy to, to do a diagnostic call with you based on your answers to this questionnaire. All right, so uh, let's dive into the material. You should all see right now an image of the Grand Canyon. And I start off with this image on purpose because I see the Grand Canyon not simply as a natural wonder, which of course it is, but the Grand Canyon is a metaphor. It is the metaphor for what each of us is capable of doing in our own lives. And this is what I mean by that. Something like six million years ago, the Colorado River formed and began inexorably excavating the ground beneath it. And today, if you hike to the base of the Grand Canyon, you will come across rock layers that are nearly two billion years old. So if you do the math, for about every year of work that the Colorado River did, it excavated about 333 years of rock layers to produce this. And what I see as each human being's capability and possibility is something analogous. With intentional effort, with focus, and with a desire to craft your own meaningful life, you can make your own Grand Canyon. Each of us does this in our own way and leaves behind a legacy. And this is something, the more conscious we are of it, it can be a, a really a beautiful way to align your energies. So ask yourself as we go, what is your Grand Canyon? All right, so I'm going to tell you three stories. And as I tell these stories, I want you to think about yourself. What lessons are applicable to you? And I'm going to make that move at the end of each story and bring it back. But as I go along, think about yourself. And the first story is called Losing Sight. And this is both a metaphor and literal. 
It's the story of my friend Dan Berlin. Dan is the guy on the left in this photo. I'm the one on the right. And Dan and I have been friends for a long time. When I first met him, he could see he's the CEO of a company and is married with two kids. Not particularly athletic, but you know, seemed like your normal guy, successful businessman. But he had a disease he didn't tell me about for a long time. The disease is called cone rod dystrophy. And with this disease, the cones and rods in his eyes are degenerating much more rapidly than they do in a healthy person. So by his mid-30s, Dan Berlin went blind. Imagine how he felt. Of course he went into despair. Of course he was depressed. Of course he felt sorry for himself and cursed the universe. It's not okay what happened to him. But then one morning he decided to get up, put on some shoes, and go for a run. And he just started running around his neighborhood, bumping into parked cars and trees, thinking he didn't kill himself. And, and he, he called me up and he said, you know, Charles, I've decided I'm going to become a runner. Now, I have been a runner since I was a child. I grew up in Nashville, as I said, and my father was in the, got into the running boom in the 70s, and I wanted to impress my dad and be like him, so I became a runner at age 10. And by age 13, I ran my first marathon in Jackson, Tennessee. And by the way, I, I came in last place, but I didn't quit. It was all about perseverance. And I've run many marathons and ultra marathons and Ironman triathlons since then. Dan knows this about me. And he called me up and said, Charles, will you guide me in the New York City Marathon? My first reaction was self-doubt. And I said, uh, I've never guided someone before. The races have always been about me, about my ego, beating my best time. And I said, I think I'm going to screw it up. And he said, don't worry, I'll show you how. And he did. You just hold a tether between the two of you, and the guy talks a lot. And so we did that first race. The morning of that New York City Marathon, I was more nervous than I'd ever been before any other race I'd done before. For the first time, it wasn't about me. It was about Dan, this guy for whom running wasn't just an, an ego boost. It was a lifeline out of the grief and depression that came from losing his eyesight. It mattered. And I, I was so worried I was going to mess it up for him. And it was an incredible experience. So we did this race. And then we did the Colorado Marathon the, year, the next year. Then we got ambitious and we did a half Ironman together, swimming. 1.2 miles, you ride bike 56 miles, you run a half marathon, 13.1 miles. Nice hard race. And Dan was getting in really good shape. And I started to get ambitious on his behalf. We went on to run a few more marathons, California International. We did Boston the last two years. We'll run Boston again this April. Now, Dan has this quote. His quote is, blindness is an inconvenience rather than a disability. Dan Berlin knows that blindness is a disability. He's in no way minimizing how horrible it was to lose his sight and what a, what a difficult issue it is for anyone who's lost their sight. But his point is that his attitude towards his own blindness is that, yeah, I'm going to treat it like an inconvenience. It could be the excuse that he uses never to run a marathon, or it could simply mean he needs to ask for help in order to run a marathon. He needs a guide. And so he did, and he did all those. And I said, all right, listen, Dan, we've done a bunch of marathons. We've done a half Ironman. You've got this great quote. If you think linearly, our next obvious physical endurance challenge would be a full Ironman, which would be hard and would be impressive. And I said, we could do that. But do you want to do something really crazy? And he said, what? I said, well, do you want to, you want to run across the Grand Canyon in the back nonstop? It's called rim to rim to rim. It's not even a race. It's just this that all ultra runners do. It looks like this. The, on the left of this graph is the South Rim, where all the tourists drive and take photos, the one that started this presentation. There's a trail called the Bright Angel Trail. You run down it all the way to the Colorado River. You cross the suspension bridge and you run across the base up the treacherous North Rim, get to the other side, turn around and come back. And it's about 46 miles, about 20,000 feet of elevation change. It's really hard. I had done it once before with three ultra athletes, just for bragging rights, <laughs> and uh, it was no joke. I asked Dan if he'd do it, and he paused for maybe a second and said, sure, of course I want to do that. Right? So we did. In October of 2014, we ran rim to rim to rim. It was 46 miles, self-supported. Uh, took us 28 hours, a lot longer than I thought it would take. But it's tough. I and mean, when you're blind, you have to be really careful. But not only was it a really interesting accomplishment, just in terms of a physical challenge, we cannot find another account documented of a person who's blind running rim to rim to rim. Dan Berlin made history 
And the press descended. It was amazing. We, we were on CBS Evening News, on Fox News, Outside Magazine, a bunch of places, all telling his incredible story. So I have a video I want to show you on, on um, this webinar. It's pretty choppy, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. I just want to sh play a, an excerpt of it. But it starts with Dan saying, you know, my name is Dan Berlin. I'm going to run rim to rim to rim. And by the way, I'm blind. And then it shows a little bit of how we guided him. I had several guides join because it, having run rim to rim to rim before, I knew what would happen to my brain and body. It breaks down. And it wouldn't be prudent or safe for me to guide him alone. So we had several guides working with him. And then let me show you this one section as we were crossing the treacherous north rim. Okay, so maybe that may have been choppy for you, but hopefully you got a sense for how absolutely scary and intimidating it was to be on the treacherous north rim. There was a thousand foot drop off, one foot to your right. I had a GoPro with me and I just put my arm out and face down and you could see the, the drop off. And We even joked with Dan, we said, man, you are so lucky you cannot see because you do not want to see what's uh, just to your right. And he said, I know, I can feel it, I can feel it. So it was, uh, it was interesting. And the way we, we worked in, as a guide is we would have one in front telling him what was coming up, tapping the rock with a hiking pole so he could hear it. He'd reach out with his poles, find it, step over. And then another guide, in this case it was me, was right behind him. So if he tripped, I could grab him. And so he was fine. He was not going to fall. I promise you, in that moment of that video, I wasn't nervous because I knew, obviously, what could happen, and I was making sure he was safe. Later, when I went back to look at my own footage, I got butterflies in my stomach. When you're not the one there making the choice, turning the wrist dial down, your mind immediately goes to the tragedy. You see how easy it would be to just trip and fall and die. And it makes you say, I, I'm, there's no way I would do that. But remember, that is the naysayer in your head. And the naysayer is important in that in that case, it keeps you alive. So thank you very much on the one hand. On the other hand, it can keep you from doing things that are utterly within reason to try. They're just intimidating or they're just challenging. And when you're the one in charge there, it's your job to put your hand on the wrist dial, turn it as low as possible, meaning to reduce the risk as much as possible, and still try the hard thing. So we, we were really inspired by this uh, experience. And what we did is we created a nonprofit called Team C Possibilities. So Dan is the one on the second from the left here, I'm the, in the, the second from the right, and then Brad and Allison are the two other co-founders of this nonprofit. And our mission is to support efforts around the world to help children who are blind. And what we do is we take on epic endurance challenges, doing things that a blind person has never done before. And then we support local efforts to work with children who are blind. We visit schools. UNICEF has arranged visits for us to schools for blind children. And uh, we raise money and donate to these, uh, to these causes. And we're not just focusing on children who are blind, though. This message, this story, is applicable to every single human being. Each one of us has within our brains a whole set of perceived limits. But our perceived limits are not always the same as our actual limits. And the space between our perceived and actual limits is where a lot of very interesting things happen. It's where growth and vitality come from. And it is a place that I like to put myself in regularly. When you're there, you are growing. You are alive. You are fully in the moment. It's a space of vitality. So what we did was the Grand Canyon, and then the following year, we went to Peru. And there's this trek, the Inca Trail. It's usually a four-day trek uh, from over three mountain passes that leads finally to this, the ancient ruins of Machu Picchu. We decided to try to do it nonstop. And the local authorities said, there's no way a blind person can do this nonstop. Believe me, we have people hiking it every day. There's a reason it's a four-day trek. And we did it in 13 hours. We completed it with just a couple minutes to spare from the cutoff that they gave us. Dan, once again, made history. 
Then this past November, we went to Africa, to Tanzania, and we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest uh, peak in the continent of Africa. And that's been climbed by a blind person a number of times, but not in the speed that we did it. It's usually a six-day trek, the route we took, and we did it in two and a half days all at night. Dan made history again, and we did it at night on purpose to highlight vision impairment. And this year, we're planning to go to the Great Wall of China and do a multi-day endurance challenge on the, on the Great Wall. So you see the trend here, the continents. Our goal is to, for Dan to make history on seven continents in seven years. So is this relevant to you? Remember what I said at the beginning? I'll tell these stories. Let's bring it back to you. So when have you experienced your own growth opportunity through struggle? How do you respond to adversity? Do you grow? Do you wither? If you're like most human beings, you do a little of both. And it's almost a question of which one is going to win as you suffer, as you grieve. What is your relationship to discomfort? And what I like about this image is he's a curmudgeon. He's a pain to be around, but she's holding his hand. She's staying with him. Discomfort is such an interesting concept. Let's dive into it just a little bit more. When you think about it, in our society, we, we seek out comfort in all forms. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Please do it. Why would you make life harder when you don't have to? I totally get it, and I'm the same. I like to sleep in a comfortable bed. Why would you sleep on the hard ground if you had a comfortable bed? Of course. But this concept of discomfort is fascinating because meaningful discomfort has some real value. And it's interesting when you seek it out. So what I mean by that is discomfort is an invitation to make a change. If you are uncomfortable, if you are experiencing discomfort, you will take action to do something about it. So you're now going to make some change. It's a gift from the universe, actually. It's a prompt for you to change something that needs to be changed, perhaps. And it accompanies growth and transformation. Sometimes the biggest gift that someone can give you is to kick you out of your comfort zone. I had a conversation with a CEO a couple of days ago who was fired from his job, and then he went on to build the company that he's leading right now. He's written a whole book about it. It's really interesting. But it happened because he was fired. I, I don't know if he would have taken the leap otherwise. He was put into that place of discomfort. Discomfort is the birthplace of resilience. It's the currency of that space between your perceived and actual limit. What does your life look like if you proactively seek out meaningful discomfort? Maybe think of it this way. Life itself is a series of additions and subtractions. We tend to celebrate the additions and we mourn the subtractions, even when those subtractions are things that we really needed to lose in our lives. So think about Dan's response to going blind. Right? The first thing he did he grieved. He suffered. He was in despair. Grief is non-negotiable when you suffer a real tragedy like that. So, And by the way, it will take however long it takes. You cannot speed it up. I'm sorry. I wish we could. But then the key is, can you get out of it? Can you not fall into cynicism and giving up? And instead, turn it to your advantage. Embrace it. In Dan's case, he was giving a talk at, at a school for blind children in Lima, Peru, that UNICEF had arranged. And I was, as I was watching him speak, I had this, these chills go down my back. And I was like, what is going on here? And I had this epiphany. Imagining in that audience a 10-year-old girl, blind since birth, who has internalized all the limitations that a blind girl would internalize from her well-meaning parents, from her peers, from her society, from herself. And then she hears Dan Berlin talk about hiking the Inca Trail in 13 hours, faster than any blind person's ever done it before, faster than most people can do, and she decides to rethink those limitations and to dive fearlessly into her own adventures. And maybe 30, 40 years from now, she becomes the first blind female president of Peru. It could happen. And as I had that train of thought, I realized Dan Berlin's impact on this world is greater because he went blind. It's not because he went blind, because of his response to going blind. That was what was in his control. And wow, look what he's doing. Look at the impact he's having. It was a terrible tragedy on the one hand, and yet out of that tragedy came this amazing thing that is changing lives around the world. That was his choice, and each of us has the possibility in the face of our own tragedies to do that. In the workshop I do with CEOs, at this point I pause and we have a discussion. And I, we go around the table and I ask people to share what is their analog? What have they suffered? And in what way did they grow from it? And some people share stories that happened to them a long time ago and they have the 
benefit of a lot of time and perspective to talk about how they grew out of it, and others are in the midst right now of suffering or grieving, and the, the, the question is can they find the words in the midst of their grief to see the growth path out of it. For every story you hear about a guy like Dan who turns this thing into some amazing opportunity, I'm sure there are many others of people who don't make it out, who, who stay cynical and stay broken. And I know that happens. And th th his story for me represents the possibility that we have, but it is not necessary. And it's actually the harder path. It's harder work to do. Okay, so the second story I want to tell you is all about optimizing performance. And in this case, I'm going to tell the story about a guy I don't know. He's not a personal friend, but he's a very interesting man. His name is Meb Kaplosigi, this guy here. Meb's amazing. He is the only man who has won an Olympic medal. He won the silver in the marathon in the 2004 uh, Olympics in Athens. He won the New York City Marathon, and he won the Boston Marathon. No other man has done that. Not only that, when he won Boston, he was 38 years old. For those of you who follow professional marathoning, 38-year-old uh, guys don't win the big races anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're over the hill by that point. The last time someone that old won Boston was 1931. But Meb did. So he's obviously doing something right. People were really excited by this. And they asked him, of course, the press descended and said, Meb, how in the world did you win Boston? And he gave a very detailed answer. In fact, he even co-wrote a book about it. And in his description, he talks about all the things that you would expect him to talk about. The, the hard training that he did, the smart training that he did, right, and the intense work that he did. You cannot win the Boston Marathon without putting in a great deal of effort. It's, it is extremely difficult. But he also said a few things that were almost throwaway lines, like side comments that point to the very secret to optimal performance. He said, for example, you have to allow adequate recovery between hard sessions. It's all about staying healthy. Of course, right? You're not going to win a marathon if you're not healthy. So you're like, yeah, everybody knows that. But think about it this way. His view of recovery is that recovery is the glue that holds all the elements of your running program together. Without it, you won't get the full benefits of the hard work you do. Recovery as glue. Or a lot of runners don't realize that it's not while you're running that you get in better shape. So pause and think about that. If you're a runner or cyclist, if you do any kind of endurance athletics, while you're running, your body is actually breaking down. There will come a point at which you just simply cannot continue running. And that's where you've gotten, you've gotten basically weaker and weaker and weaker. But then after you've done that exercise, you come home, you eat healthy foods, you get protein in, you rest, the muscles come back a little stronger. So you break your body down, you rest and recover and come back a little stronger. Break your body down, rest and recover, come back a little stronger. That's the cycle of how a person can start off being kind of out of shape and not a good runner and then becoming a very good runner through, through that breakdown recovery. He also said, being as dedicated to your recovery as you are to your harder workouts will allow you to perform at your max. And now we're starting to get to this secret here and the mistake that I see people making over and over again. This is a classic mistake of ambitious people. Notice what he said, dedicated to your recovery. If you are ambitious, it's natural, it's easy actually to work really hard and you will err on the side of working really hard. You'll do emails even though you're on vacation with your family, right? Because you can, you're trying to build a company. I'm sorry, right? And th that's just a very natural way to be. But what Med says is treat recovery with the same respect that you treat your hard work. So what is the classic rookie runner mistake? Maybe you've never run before and you decide, you know what, I'm going to run a marathon. That's my bucket list thing. So you put down your bucket list or run a half marathon. And I know Andy is training for his first half marathon right now, too. So I don't know if you made this mistake. What happens classically, right, you get ambitious, you've you got your goal, and you start running a lot. Maybe you never ran before, and now you're running six days a week, 45 minutes at a time, pretty hard pace. You know what's going to happen, of course, right? You're going to get injured, you're going to get sick, and you're going to underperform race day. Classic. So what they do is they train hard all the time. And often in the race itself, a rookie will start off too fast and then just completely break and be super slow in the back half of the race. So what Mav says is one of the biggest differences between the training of world-class runners and that of recreational runners is how slowly we elites sometimes run. How slowly. They know the difference between the hard workout and the recovery workout. 
when they're doing their hard workout, of course, none of us can touch them. We could not keep up with them. But when they're doing a recovery workout, it's actually easy. And they, they know that. They don't wake up on a day that's supposed to be a recovery workout day and say, oh, I'm feeling really good. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run hard today. They treat it with the same respect. So the secret then to optimal performance is this term periodization. And it simply means breaking down a goal into its constituent parts that, that complement one another so that you build up to your ability to reach this ambitious goal. And what I just build out here is this an example of a typical 12-week training cycle that uh, a runner, a marathon runner, or a triathlete, or a weightlifter, anyone who's trying to build up their body's ability to perform, what they might do over a 12-week period. And it's based on the concept of supercompensation. Now, I'll pause here and say, there was one time where I showed this graph to a group of CEOs, and one of the CEOs interrupted me and said, Charles, this is such an interesting graph. I said, why? And he said, this graph mirrors my top line revenue, my company's top line revenue for the past 12 years. He said, it's the weirdest thing. Every fourth year, I'm down. And he said, the first time it happened, I was freaking out because we were on this great growth curve, and then boom, we're down. And I was like, what's going on? And he said, I started to recognize the pattern. And the pattern was in my business, we would literally outgrow our infrastructure. We, we just got to a point where the, what the, we needed to consolidate for a while and figure out how to restructure in order to scale for growth. And that would happen basically on a four-year cycle for me. And after, the, after it happened again, I started not freaking out about it and recognizing, oh, this is the time where I need, now need to focus on internal processes. And then we will return back to that you know, curve of growth. So what a runner does is very similar. There's this organic move. And this is true with businesses as well. We all expect it always to be up and to the right, but the world doesn't work that way. Right? It's okay that we have ups and downs, of course, and plan on it, assume it, expect it. The way it works for a runner is in weeks one, two, and three, your workouts are increasingly more challenging as measured by duration and intensity of the workout. But week four is a recovery week. You allow your body to consolidate the gains and to recover from all the hard work, the breaking down that's occurred over the three weeks of building up. And then weeks five, six, and seven are back on the slope of the curve. But week eight is a recovery and week 12 is a recovery. The slope of the curve cannot and will not remain this steep of performance gain if you skip the recovery weeks. And believe me, people have tried. If the name of the game in marathon you know, competition was whoever runs the, the most wins, they'd all run 23 hours a day. But they do not because it does not work that way. And they've learned it the hard way. So if you start doing research in this area, you'll see quotes such as, there's no such thing as overtraining, just under recovery. Or avoiding overtraining is probably the most important key there is to attaining athletic excellence. The most? More than the hard work? And the reason for these quotes is that this is the classic mistake the ambitious, aggressive people are making, the ones who are dedicated to task. So I'll interrupt here and say, this whole concept is irrelevant if you're working with someone who is lazy and not trying, then that's not, this is not the problem statement. The problem statement I'm working here because I work with CEOs, these are people who are trying to do something difficult. They're trying to build a business. They're trying to grow. They're taking the harder path. And this is the classic mistake I see over and over again. So the key is overtraining and pushing too hard is the mistake ambitious people seem to make. So periodization, this concept, makes obvious sense for athletes. And I won't belabor the point anymore. But let's see, is this relevant to you, to your work life? Is it possible to take this concept of periodization and apply it to the much more complex, nuanced world of work? You know, a marathon is really simple. It's 26.2 miles. It's a date and time. You can back out 12 weeks from that date and train for it. It's pretty straightforward. But work it isn't like that. With work, you're constantly hit with unexpected things. The com your competitor can do something unexpected. There are just so many more moving parts, and it never ends. It's not like there's a race day and it's over. There's a constant series of these things. So can you take this concept and yet apply it to the workplace? Let's try. And I'll give you examples of periodization at work. So what you're doing right now, the time you're taking right now to listen to this presentation is periodization. You've created the space to listen to a presentation that you hope, I assume, will give you some perspective or data, information that you can then use to improve your life or to grow. Apply in whatever way is helpful to you. 
That is periodization. Congratulations for doing that. Meditation is another example of periodization. And what's so interesting is, I don't know, not too long ago, I think med meditation was considered fringe. It has been fully adopted in corporate America. And if uh, you want to hear in detail about it, read David Gellis' book, Mindful Work. It documents the way in which corporate America has, has adopted meditation. And the way it's happened is senior people, CEOs and senior executives, discovered it in their own personal life because they were so overwhelmed and exhausted. And then they realized how powerful it is, and they bring it to work and they lead the meditation sessions over lunch and then no more people do it. If you need an app, go to headspace.com. If you've never meditated before, that application is a beautiful way to just introduce you to meditation. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity for you to calm your mind and come from a place of serenity and calm while dealing with the complexities at work. It's an excellent thing to, to do and it is a good way to balance your day. And then of course you knew that I would say this, exercise. There's a direct link between regular exercise and productivity. Now, there's also a negative link if you go to the gym on Tuesdays from 2 to 5 p.m. No, thank you, you're taking advantage of, the, of my point, so please don't do that. But appropriately integrating exercise into your life will, uh, will make you more productive. Right? So what I suggest when I meet with CEOs and other people who are building companies is make it movement friendly. I will summarize many years of research done by the medical community and say, if you do not move your body regularly, bad things will happen. <laughs> That's my oversimplified summary of all the medical science. It is actually that simple. You don't have to have an ego about it. You don't have to run marathons. You don't have to be competitive. But you do need to move your body regularly in whatever way is satisfying to you. If you don't, bad things happen to you. It's unhealthy. We all know this. But it's hard. And so I want to give you some really simple examples of things you can do to make your company movement friendly. If you have a meeting with someone, a one-on-one, -on -one, that doesn't require you to be seated in front of a screen, just go for a walk with them. Make it a walking one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's the simplest thing you can do. You get free exercise. It's more fun, maybe even more creative as you're moving out there. So look at your calendar over the next week and identify where in your calendar is there any place where you could change a meeting to a walking one-on-one -on -one and go do that. You role model exercising regularly. If you are the head of the company or a senior person in the company and you don't obviously exercise, the people who report to you and who are ambitious won't know whether or not they're allowed to. And they won't know if it's, are they weird for taking time off for lunch to exercise or is it okay in this culture. Role model it. Make it a topic. Explain to them, I want you to move. I want you to keep your body healthy. It's okay. Just do it in a way that allows you to get your work done. Here's how I do it. You know, early in the morning, over lunch, whatever you do. But make it a topic. And then standing meetings. If you want a meeting to be short, have everybody stand. It'll be over in 10 minutes. And there are companies where, where everyone works in the same place. And what they do is they'll just bring all the team leaders together, for example, and go around the horn and say, who's got a quick update? And this is, this is an aspect of the Rockefeller habits, exactly that daily huddle. You can do this as a standing meeting if everyone's together as well. And, but it just, boom, move it. They just get it done. And then pedometers or Fitbits to log your steps. Whatever, whatever you do that encourages movement and saying we encourage it here. So what you might do, for example, is you could say um, whoever walks the greatest number of steps in a month gets a, an award, gets recognition, so you make it competitive. Or you could say when all of us collectively walk X number of steps, we make a charitable contribution to this charity we all chose. What? It doesn't matter. The whole point is that we value movement here. And we know how fundamentally important taking care of your body is to your productivity, and movement is, is central to that, so please do it. Another thing is to-do lists. I love to-do lists, and in fact, I wouldn't be standing or sitting here talking to you if I didn't make one myself. It was when I made a to-do list when I turned 40 years old that I decided I was going to start having crazy adventures with my kids, and that started me down a whole path that had me leave the corporate world and become an adventurer and do a bunch of crazy things. But that was because of my to-do list, and I love it. But what about a to-don't list? And by that, I mean, what patterns do you want to change? Right? What negative behaviors can you modify in your life? Remember, life is a series of additions and subtractions. Make that column of subtractions. Be conscious about it and choose the stuff you're not going to do. And what aspects of your job should you delegate? This is the most important key, I think, to building a scalable organization is learning how to delegate. Of course, you hire good people, you train them, and you let them do the work. You don't have to be involved in every materially significant transaction. It's impossible once the company grows beyond about 10 million or so. It just doesn't work. 
So delegate. So optimal performance, this concept, it really requires discipline, both in what you do and in what you don't do. So now I've, I've given you this concept, and I don't know what's going through your mind in terms of how it might be applicable to you, but let me make it very specific. I want to walk you through an example of a 24-hour period that is periodized, a work day, and it would look like this. You wake up in the morning. Ideally, you've slept about seven hours. There's a lot of sleep research out there, and the rough consensus is for most human beings, about seven hours of sleep a night leads to optimal performance. Now, if you're like most of us, I got my phone here, you wake up, alarm goes off, and you reach over and go, ah, oh, like text, email, social media, text, email, social media. Don't do that. I don't want you to check your phone when you first wake up. Please don't. Instead, the very first thing I want you to do is to meditate. I mean, if you have to pee, go pee. Then after you pee, meditate. Meditate for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then after that, exercise. Maybe take a 20-minute walk with friends or family if you want to make it social. But do you notice if you do this, what you've just done? You started off the day honoring your mind and honoring your body. And your mind and body are the fundamental components of any productivity you'll have, of course. It's so interesting to me that I find many people I speak with, particularly successful executives I speak with, seem to think that self-care, taking care of their mind and their body, is, an, is a secondary thing that they sometimes get to if they have time, but they usually don't have time. It's backwards. Your mind and your body, they're the foundation of all the productivity that you're going to have. So prioritize them leads you to be more productive. It's not the other way around. So then shower and get dressed. Have you checked email and text yet? No, I don't want you to. When you check email and text when you first get up, you're off balance. You are now responding to what has come in. So instead, what I'd like you to do is review your to-do list if you've already written it. If you haven't written it, write it. Proactively plan your day so you are structuring your day. And then you can decide later what, is, what things come in, how you deal with them. But be proactive and forward-looking as opposed to off balance and responding to all the things that have come in, the onslaught. And then have breakfast. If you, if you have a family you live with, uh, then focus on them. If you're like most of us, you've got these little windows of time when you're with the people you love. And breakfast is typically one of them. So that is not the time to be doing email or even reading the newspaper. Imagine yourself 30 years from now, magically transported back in time to your breakfast scene. And what that person would think about this breakfast scene. And that person would be very annoyed if you're sitting here checking your email when your beautiful child is right across from you wanting to engage. Right? Or whatever that thing is. So give yourself perspective of finding those moments in the day where you want to be fully present. And with our loved ones, those actually are quite a small number of things typically. So treasure them. And now, yes, finally, it is okay to check your email and text before you go to work. And the reason is I don't want you to walk into the office and have some surprise waiting on you that you really should have known about before you walk in the door. But the purpose is just to make sure you're on top of anything that might surprise you. So now go to work. You arrive at work. Maybe you get there, I don't know, 8 o'clock. And you respond to emails and crank through all that stuff for half an hour. And then maybe at 8.30 you have a 20-minute walking one-on-one -on -one with one of your direct reports. And then maybe you've got your daily huddle. You do a 10-minute standing group meeting with everybody giving updates you know, until, until 9. Then you spend the morning focused on high priority, time sensitive work. If it is low priority, will you please delegate it? I don't want you working on anything low priority during your business hours. All low priority items should be delegated. So high priority, and then if it's time sensitive, try to knock it out. Just get it done because it's going to sit on your shoulder. So if you can get rid of your time sensitive stuff out front, do that. And then for lunch, maybe you exercise first and you eat afterward to get your workout in and you could do it with staff or customers. Think about business. Fundamental to business is relationships. So in your day, look at all the possibilities you have to develop and build relationships. And meals together are a wonderful way to develop relationships with the customers or with the people you work with. Right? And exercise is a way to do it as well. So you could exercise with them or you could eat with them. If you're pretty high up in the hierarchy or owner of the business, CEO, Try to eat with your staff, and ideally, the low on the hierarchy. One, it will show them your respect, and two, you may hear things that you wouldn't hear otherwise. Right? So treat these windows of relationship building as exactly that, as opposed to a time where I can just catch up on email, you know, sitting at my desk eating some food. 
And then after you've eaten lunch, I would like you to please take a nap. And yes, I did just suggest that you sleep at work. I gave this presentation one time to a large audience, and like 500 people or whatever, and a guy screamed out, you're crazy. And of course, you know, I loved hearing that. I don't mind being called crazy at all. But I kind of laughed, and we had this back and forth, and, and um, he just said, you know, it just doesn't make sense in our environment. And I told him the story of when I worked at Intel. That, you know, they had an employee handbook that said, sleeping at your desk is grounds for immediate dismissal. So I, I get it. I did not take naps when I worked at Intel. It was not okay in that culture. And I understand. I mean, what if you're lying down, like drool's coming out, and a customer walks in? Like, that's not okay, right? That's not the image you want for your company. So I understand. But if you were primarily focused on optimizing your performance, you'd take a nap after you eat. It's normal. It's human physiology. There are entire cultures that do this. It's called a siesta. And in China, there are companies where it's mandatory. They turn the lights down and everybody rests their head on the desk. It's like the communist approach to napping. You will take a nap. Right? So what, what's going on here, I think, is that in our culture, we, we have a facade, like a Superman facade. And we're supposed to show no weakness. And napping looks pretty weak. So the issue is how then do you figure out how to nap in a way that's appropriate? And there's been a lot of research done on this. And I'll just like highlight some of the values that have already been documented through research. So for example, napping helps you learn new information. And specifically what's going on is the hippocampus is the part of the brain that retains short-term memory. So it's the part of the brain that would allow you to repeat the sentence I just said. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that allows you to retain short-term memory. But five minutes from now, you won't be able to repeat that sentence, right, unless you really work to, to retain it. And that's the neocortex that is responsible for longer-term memory. When you're sleeping, actually there's a transference of data from the hippocampus to the neocortex. And there have been studies done of people who were shown a random set of data, like images and photos and facts, and then one group napped and the other didn't, and then they were tested on their retention of just this random information, and the group that napped had up to an 80% improvement in retention. It was precisely because of this transference that occurs. So if you nap after lunch, you actually will retain more of the work you were doing in the morning. So it makes you more productive, actually, and you gain energy. It's a, it's a mini recovery in the middle of the day that then gives you the boost to continue working at a higher level the rest of the day. And it actually can give you a jolt of creativity. And this is based on brain science, looking at left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And to oversimplify, roughly, the left part of the brain is responsible for critical thinking, and the left is responsible for creativity, and the right is responsible for creativity. And in this study, they, they just w did an MRI measuring the, the brain activity during sleeping. And what they found is the left side of the brain is pretty much dormant during sleep, and the right side is active and bright and moving. So when you wake up, often you, you literally will have an epiphany about some problem you're working on, and the creative part of your brain has been engaged. And so you can come out of a nap saying, oh, you know what I'm going to do is this. You literally get a jolt of creativity coming out of a short nap. And of course, it can just help you be more pleasant to be around. It's kind of like drinking a cup of coffee without the caffeine addiction <laughs> that comes with it. So anyway, I'll stop harping on the, the, the reasons behind it, but I'll just make one final point. I gave this talk one time and there was a guy in the group, in the audience, who was a judge. And he said, Charles, I, you're preaching to the choir. I completely agree with you. I have a couch in my office. I take naps. I'm a judge. I have to re retain such complex information. I need it. And I said, well, that's great. Congratulations. And he said, no, the problem is my fellow judges harass me about it. They, I close the door and they come by. They know when I'm napping and they hammer on the door and they say, wake up. And I laughed. I was like, that's pretty funny, like frat boys or whatever. And he said, it's not funny. They're not doing it in a good-natured way. They are, it's like bullying. That They think I'm weird for doing it. And I said, well, well, that's, that's on them. And if you want, I'll come and even give a talk and say, you're brilliant and they're idiots for being that way. But it doesn't matter. The point is, in his culture, in his work environment, it's just not okay for him to nap. And so I understand it. And there are little ways people get around it. You can do things like hold your keys in your hand and just sit at your desk and close your eyes just for a minute, and then when the keys drop out of your hand, you wake up. Uh, there are lots of little things like that you could try to do if you're in a hostile environment to napping. But the main thing you can do is if you run the company, make it okay. Uh, I gave a talk in Houston two weeks ago, and the CEO brought me to his, uh, during a break to his nap room, and they have a hammock in there. And one of the other CEOs said, well, what if somebody sleeps for four hours in that hammock, like abuses the privilege? And he said, I don't care. He said, I hire knowledge workers here. So they're measured on their 
productivity and what they're doing. If the guy needs to sleep four hours in the afternoon, as long as he's productive, I'm not going to micromanage him, right? So you could do that with that type. If you're a fact, uh, you know, factory workers on the floor, of course, that's not okay. You'd have to, you would have to manage that. But just that attitude is fascinating because he's interested in results and productivity. And if that's what you were primarily interested in, you take a nap after lunch. All right, so the afternoon then, focus on high priority. Remember, if it's low priority, please delegate it. Longer term strategy. Do you have built into your schedule, and ideally daily, time when you're thinking about your longer term growth, both as an individual and the company's longer term strategy? We get sucked into the daily operational crisis of the moment. But the longer term stuff, if you're a senior, that's your job. Figure out where it's going, what inflection points are coming, what are the competitors going to do, how do you disrupt yourself, what is your longer term strategy, build it in. And then at night, maybe half hour or so before your bedtime, set your bedtime so you're tr you know you're going to get roughly seven hours of sleep, and then get away from the screens. They artificially keep you awake. Now I'll say this, if you love what I just presented, like you know what, I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to create my own periodized day. And then you try it, and it works for a few days, and then you know your friends ask you to go party, and you stay out, and you only get four hours of sleep. That's fine. I do that all the time. That's totally fine. There's nothing in here that's like written in stone. You have to do it. If you don't do it, you're a failure. These are just tools, of course, that are always available to you. And each of us is always at time zero, meaning we can always go from this moment and change. We have our history. We have a linear trajectory, but we can change. So these tools are always available to you. Return to them at any point. Use them in whatever way is useful to you with your schedule. So think of it this way. We have two primary resources as individuals, our time and our energy. And this combination of time and energy generates wealth. Right? So you, you, how you spend your time and how you spend your energy, this is literally our wealth generating capacity. So I'm going to ask you a personal question. This is in the questionnaire that I sent out. It's one of them, and, I, and I'll give you the context for why I put that question in there. So how wealthy are you? Now, if you're like most of us in this society, the first thought that comes to mind is your bank account and your assets, your material wealth. Totally fine. That's, that matters. That is the one that is celebrated most in this culture, and we need to focus on that. Without it, we suffer a great deal. So in my CEO workshops, I have had this conversation with many CEOs, and I've started to notice a, a pattern, and I'm going to show you what is average of what I, the, the numbers that I see from most CEOs. So for this question, the scale is 1 to 10. It's not related to anything except your perception of yourself. So it's a relative number. But in your mind, how do you rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 in material wealth? Most of the CEOs are something like an 8 or so. Some put 10 up there, whatever. It's, it's a high number for them because they've spent so much energy generating material wealth. And then think about it uh, this way. There are other forms of wealth in this world than material. The physical health is a form of wealth, right? So how wealthy is your physical health? Many of the CEOs I work with, mm, maybe more like a four. And the reason for this is there's this dichotomy. It's almost this, this zero-sum game between being able to take care of my body the way I want to and get all of my work done. And there's also another part, which is your emotional health. And that often can be even less because of all the stress that people are under, maybe a three. So remember the periodized day. You started off with meditation and exercise. Honor your mind, honor your body. Those are the components that go into your physical health and your emotional health. And they often are quite low in relative to material wealth for many of the people I work with. And then the final form of wealth that I'll talk about here is vitality. Life energy, the thing that gets you going, that gets you excited, it's your authentic self and expression, you know it. When you see someone who's full of vitality, you want to be around that person. You want a piece of it for yourself. They got something figured out. They just know who they are and they're living the world, their life in this world the way they want to. I've seen that number being even lower than the physical health and the emotional health. So this trend, this model is, all, is quite typical of many of the CEOs I work with. And if you add up the numbers of the material wealth, physical health, emotional health, and vitality, in this case, it's 17. But the potential, if it's 10 across the board, would be 40. So this person's wealth potential is 42.5%, which is failing. It's an F, okay? So if you think in terms of how wealthy you are across these four categories, well, maybe you've got some work to do, even though your bank account looks great. 
So what I've found is people want to get, you know, better scores. And it's in your own mind. It's your own relationship to yourself. And the first step to doing that is recognizing that there's not actually a zero-sum game going on here. You do not have to sacrifice your physical health and your emotional health and your vitality in order to be materially wealthy. You don't. You could. Many people do. It's a model that is quite prevalent in the society, but it's utterly unnecessary. The things actually go together. The more time you spend focusing on self-care in an appropriate way, the, the wealthier you will be across all categories in your life. So my mission then is to help people think about, think about this, why you do what you do, and then how can you add passion and drive to your life. And as you do that, you will become wealthier across the board. This is what I've found when I've talked with CEOs about this. I'll bring this topic up. We'll, we'll, you know, they'll, I'll either work with them one-on-one -on -one or we'll have these group discussions. And I want to list out some of the issues that, that come up time and time again. So the, probably the most common one is this. The, the working hard comes at the price of reduced physical and emotional health. They just don't have time to take care of their bodies. And, and they'll push back and like, Charles, you know, I love this concept, but I'm telling you, I do not have an hour and a half to go spend in the gym, and I can't just you know, meditate 40 minutes a day or whatever you want me to do. And my answer to that is you do not have to go to the gym for an hour and a half to have physical health. It's one way to do it. You're welcome to do that if that's how you want to spend your time. You can, in your current workday, if you don't exercise at all, I could go through with you your current workday and show you exactly where you could exercise, and you'll get in better shape without spending one extra minute on it. You literally can reallocate your time in a way where you're doing all the same things, but you just happen to also be exercising. The walking one-on-one -on -one is the most obvious example, but there are others. So that's one. Another that I see regularly is you're married, you got kids, you have professional success, like whatever the facade is of success in this society, and yet they feel like something is missing. You got it all. You look at on paper, everybody's like, congratulations, you, you've arrived. And yet, something is missing. This is your authentic self nudging you. And we'll talk in a minute about nudges. But there's something there. I've also worked with, with CEOs or executives who are going, who've just gone through a painful divorce or they're about to become an empty nester. These are external events that you may have chosen or may have happened to you or just occur over time that will force you into a new phase of life whether you like it or not. You're now there and you can try to put your head in the sand or not, but you're going to have to deal with it. Maybe you're planning to sell your business or reinvent your career. Uh, and in that case, you are proactively putting yourself into that space. And then maybe you want to make an important life change, but you want to do it in a responsible way. All these things are quite common issues across the board um, with people I've worked with. So what I realized is People will come up and ask to do this one-on-one, -on -one, and I've done that, but I decided that there's a better way to do it. With it. It's just a group setting, and I created a small group executive mentoring program that's for business leaders. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm giving them permission to focus on self-care. And by the way, when you focus on self-care, the benefits aren't just for you. They extend to everyone around you. It's amazing to see that once you make that mind shift. And so the idea is how you inject vitality in your work and home life, how you increase your productivity by actually even working less, that's using the periodization concept, and how you gain greater control over your time by reframing your relationship to your time. And then in the end, at the end of the program, the goal is that you're physically and emotionally healthier. You've integrated these sparks of vitality that I work on, with you on to develop, and then you increase this overall wealth potential, potential percentage. And that's what this application, that form is. This is the baseline that I use, and I walk through it with the CEO, executive and, I, and we get a sense of where they are and then at the end of the eight weeks we return to it and I say let's go again let's ask the same set of questions what changed what has happened and so we're clear there's almost a way of quantifying your own perceived you know, improvement and this I do in their live led calls they're like this so it'll be uh, a webinar it'll be um, uh, virtual online where it's a video conference and people are participating and they've got one-on-one -on -one email access to me, a private Facebook group so that they share. So it's not just my knowledge, but they're helping one another. And that's the most powerful part. When you have a group dynamic, you have people who are checking in on one another. And you have an artificial forcing function of every week at this time, I'm going to show up. And we're going to give each other feedback on it. And then I work up front to make sure that I've vetted that this is a person who really is committed to personal growth and who wants to engage. 
If you do that, then it works. If you just want to sit back and listen to someone say platitudes, or I mean, it could be wisdom, but you just listen and don't actually apply it to your own life, then it's not it's not for you. This is something for to be engaged and actually seek out your own growth. All right, so let me tell one last story, and then I'll take questions. And this is my own story, and this is my decision to leave the corporate world. So I worked at Intel, as I said, for 14 years, and it was a great role. I, I, I did a number of jobs there, which I loved. And the last six years in that role, I was, uh, I was a director in Intel Capital, which is the venture capital group. What was so incredible about that position is I was working with entrepreneurs every day, people who were taking ideas that did not exist in this world, and then boom, almost godlike, bringing them to life, nurturing them, and trying to keep them alive. It's, it's the hardest thing you can do. They almost always die. You can do everything right, but then some macro thing like 9-11 or the Great Recession just whoosh, takes it all away from you. Or you can not really do everything right and get lucky and get bought by Cisco for some you know, ridiculous reason that you didn't even see, and everybody thinks you're brilliant. You're like, wow, how did you do that? And you know you got lucky? You're like, oh, I don't know. I was smart, I guess. I've seen all of that. But what I realized in those experience in, was, experiences was how powerful this creative energy the entrepreneurial energy that can be expressed in a specific way, how powerful that is. And I decided even though I had a great job, made good money, really it wasn't bad, it was just I wanted this new thing, this entrepreneurial energy. So I went to my boss and I said, I love you guys, it's been a great run, but I'm going to leave and I'm going to become, before I even said anything, my boss said, IBM, Qualcomm, AMD, a competitor, competitor, competitor. And I said, no, I'm not doing that to you guys, I'm not playing that game, I'm going to leave and I'm going to become an adventurer! Yay! Yay for me! And my boss just said, oh dude, this is called a midlife crisis, right? It's okay, we love you, but you're going to run out of money, and once you get through your little crisis, you, you, know, you probably need a job, so I'll try to hold one for you, I guess, if I can. But listen, here's the thing about midlife crisis. We use it to kind of end the conversation when someone does something weird, but midlife crisis isn't the end of the conversation. It's the beginning of a fascinating conversation about phases of life. And in midlife, the primary task is authenticity and creating your own meaningful life. And that was what I was doing. So I said, let's just see what will happen. And so what I did is, as an adventurer, I just I do crazy endurance challenges linked to charitable causes. I've cycled over 7,000 miles with my children. I guide my blind friend, which I told you about. And I write books and articles about it, encouraging other people to challenge their own limits and see what they can do when they channel this vitality. And I give keynotes and workshops and do these mentoring, the one-on-ones and the group mentoring as well. This is my own path. Now, this decision to leave that corporate life, that 14-year career, it both excited and intimidated me. I'm married, I have two kids, I have responsibilities, I can't just go off and do whatever I want to do. There are real consequences for these decisions. If something excites you and intimidates you, go do it now. If it excites you, it is your authentic self asking to be expressed. And if it intimidates you, it is going to put you right in that space between your perceived and actual limits. That combination is magic. That combination is growth. That combination creates all kinds of vitality. All right, so I want to be clear here. My disclaimer is I am not here to encourage you to quit your job and become an adventurer. That is probably a really bad idea. If you want to do that, that's on you. Do not blame me for that. But I am here to encourage you to seek out challenges that excite and intimidate you, right, and find that combination and act on it. The time is now. So some of the trips I did with my kids, I said I cycled over 7,000 miles. You know, when my son was eight, we cycled the length of Japan. I'll tell you just a quick anecdote in a second about that. My daughter was six. We pedaled over the Rocky Mountains. Now, if you have a six-year-old child and you want them to ride their own bicycle over the Rocky Mountains, what is wrong with you? That's crazy. That's not appropriate for a child on their own bicycle. But on a trailer cycle, as you can see here, one that connects to the adult's bike, it's completely reasonable to do. So everything I've done with my kids, it may sound crazy, but actually there's a way to turn the wrist out down and make it work. And I am married. This is my wife in the photo. She has a serious full-time job at the United Nations and can't take full summers off for these big adventures, which is what I do. I do it in the two months of summer. So she joins for part of, of each ride. It's not perfect. Of course she'd want to go along the entire ride, but she can't. And you just do the best we can. All right, so this trip across Japan with my son was very interesting. What happened here, you see the trailer cycle set up, and you see the panniers that we had. So we carried a tent, we carried all of our gear. And this is a photo from the northern tip of Japan, Cape Soya. And so here's where it started. Cape Soya is at the very top there. 
and we cycled all this, this kind of random route through Japan. It wasn't the most direct route. We weren't trying to break some speed record. That would have been inappropriate for an eight-year-old. But we were visiting World Heritage Sites, places like Shirakami Sanchi, which is this last unre remaining unspoiled beach forest in all of Asia. It took us 67 days, 2,500 miles. We went over 10 mountain passes. The only time my eight-year-old son explicitly expressed self-doubt in his ability to do this hard trip was when we met strangers who saw that bike set up and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're you know, cycling the length of Japan. And invariably, the first words out of their mouth, well, that's too hard for an eight-year-old. The first time my son heard that, he took a step back and looked at me and said, wait, is this too hard for me? It had not occurred to him until the adult took the naysayer concept and shoved it in his brain. And I told him, listen, he doesn't know. He's never cycled across Japan, I'm sure. I don't think any eight-year-old has. You're probably the first. But, and I don't even know either. Let's just try. And then I told him this proverb. The proverb is the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. What does your life look like if you think that way? So the naysayers did emerge. Here's a, a note I got from a guy right before we left to retrace the Lewis and Clark Trail, the one where my six-year-old pedaled over the Rocky Mountains. He said, do you not understand that the American highway is no place for a six-year-old kid? You have logging trucks whizzing by you at 80 miles an hour with pieces falling off, drunk drivers, coming, uh, people coming around blind curves into the mountain speeding. What the duck is wrong with you? And he didn't say duck. Now, it's okay. I don't know this guy. And at first I was a little bit annoyed at him because the way he ended it, he applies I'm an idiot. But then I realized Don's this interesting example of a naysayer. And this is true classically of naysayers. Every example he gives, yeah, he's right. They're legitimate concerns that I should take into account as a father if I'm with my children on a trip like this. The only problem is that he concludes that I'm an idiot if I proceed. And this is the judgment call we all need to make when we're trying something crazy, is what is appropriate? And there are ways to deal with every one of these problems. Like when the trucks zoom by, we literally get in the grass. It's not New York City. They're not constantly zooming by. It's just every so often they do. And my kids, you know, whoever calls it out first gets a point because you can hear them coming. So there's a long list of things I figured out. So I wrote Don back and I just said, listen, you know, I understand it makes you nervous, but we've done a lot of these trips and I'm, I'm you know, I care about my kids and I'm going to keep them safe. Here's our blog. Please follow us. He never responded. He just wanted to put me in my place as a person who's acting outside of convention, which is what naysayers are doing. They're trying to make you act conventionally. But there is a nuanced difference between being appropriately prudent, which is fine, all of his concerns, but then being a naysayer who stifles innovation. And that's the critical difference. I think in, the, in your office um, work context as well, if a person comes in and tells you all the reasons the, the strategy that you're trying to employ, this risk growth strategy isn't going to work, that's fine. But they can't sit there and not do anything except throw you know, stones at you. Put them in charge of the team that comes up with a mitigation strategy to deal with all of the very good points that they made. Right? So don't allow the naysayer to stifle innovation. Allow the naysayer to bring up all the good points around which you need to develop a mitigation strategy. So, when, when, you know, it was hard with my kids, and when it got hard on these trips, I said, listen, it'll be okay. Sometimes an adventurer just suffers for a while. Whenever you're going through a rough patch in your life, just say that to yourself. It'll be okay. Sometimes an adventurer just suffers for a while. That's fine. That's growth. It just makes the bubble bath feel that much better when you take it at night. Now, these three explosions are my eight-year-old son's you know, massive temper tantrums in the first week of the trip across Japan. I thought, it's over. It's not going to work. And then I realized the reason he was throwing these temper tantrums is that I wasn't being a good listener. And when I sat down with him after the third one, I said, listen, you've got to stop the temper tantrums. What, you know, what, do, what do we need? What do I need to do? I, I had a conversation where I said, listen, I, I, can't, you know, I can't promise to do everything you ask, but I can listen to you. I will. And if I can do what you want, I will. And the other thing is I see you as a team member, not as a little kid. See yourself like that. We're team members trying this hard thing. And then finally, if you don't want to keep doing this trip, we can go home. You, know, you just tell me you want to keep going or not. And he said, no, it's okay. We can keep going. The rest of the trip after that first week, the temper tantrums disappeared. In fact, I was the one throwing the temper tantrums in the Japanese Alps because it was so hard. And I was like, it's okay, Daddy. You can, you, you can do it. Keep going. We switched roles. Very annoying. But the lesson I got from this temper tantrum experience was, was really that I needed to be a more effective leader to complete this ride across Japan. And this is the framework where leader is effective and boss is less effective. A boss gets the work done, gets the job done too, but not nearly as well as a leader does. So the leader coaches, whereas the boss lectures. The leader depends on goodwill, whereas the boss will focus on the authority to force people to do what they have to do. The leader generates enthusiasm instead of focusing on inspiring fear. 
the leader fixes the breakdown instead of blaming people, shows how it's done instead of being a know-it-all, develops instead of uses people, asks instead of commands. Now, if you'd asked me to describe the type of leader I was at that time, I would have confidently told you I was on the left of this framework, but my son's temper tantrums in the first week showed really that I was behaving on the right, like a boss, you know, kind of telling him what to do. I can justify myself. I mean, I'd never done a trip like this before. I was overwhelmed and exhausted, and managing kind of an overly sensitive eight-year-old's emotional state was kind of low on my list of to-dos and priorities. But it doesn't matter what my excuse is. The point is, when I shifted and behaved more like a leader and talked with him in a respectful way and gave him agency and the ability to even end the trip if he wanted to, he, he rose to the occasion. He was fine. So the image I have is the leader is like a coach, whereas the boss is like RoboCop. R RoboCop works too, but RoboCop does not generate love, whereas a coach does. This is what the coach says. The coach sees potential and nurtures it. Like maybe you're a baseball coach, you got a player, he struck out the first three you know, games every time he's been at bat. You don't go to that player and say, well, you're terrible at baseball. A good coach says, I see where you're making your mistake. You know, focus on the ball, slow your breathing, whatever. Whatever the coaching is, when that kid finally gets on base, he loves you. You've helped him like travel a journey that he wants to travel but doesn't know how. So you generate love. And we all have people in our history who've played that role for us. And, and just think about the feeling. You can do the same thing with the people who work for you. R. Parsegian is a football coach who said, a good coach will make his players see what they can become rather than what they are. So in your organization, whoever you're working with or is working for you, imagine their potential and help them reach it and what you've just generated is love and loyalty and um, an, an organization that can operate remarkably effectively. So to think of a coaching model uh, when you feel this, this strain that you're feeling of this ambitious goal. So here's the postcard we send to the naysayers. Turns out an eight-year-old can cycle the link to Japan. Thank you very much. Now, this was the photo taken at the last day of the trip. It was very hot down there. It was the end of August, the southern tip of, of Kyushu in Japan. And at this point, my son asked me, he's like, Daddy, why do you write all the time? And I had been taking notes throughout this whole trip, and he saw me writing. And I said, well, you know, if, if um, it's a really interesting trip, and I will rem remember it. And if you write things down while they're fresh, you know, it's, it's easier to remember, and it's better. But I said, really, what I realized um, is I'm going to write a book. And he said, well, what's the book going to be about? And I said, well, it's going to be about this trip. But really, it's my way of saying I love you. And he said, you can just tell me that. You don't have to write a whole book about it. And I said, and here's the book. It's called Rising Sun. And I said, uh, no, seriously, buddy, you know, at some point I'm going to die. And after I die, maybe you'll miss me. And whenever you miss me, I'll be waiting for you right there in the pages. And as I said those words, I realized what this whole trip was all about. I had actually taken a two-month unpaid leave of absence from Intel, and this was during the Great Recession. And initially they threatened to fire me. And then in the end, instead of firing me, I convinced them to sponsor the trip. But it took me a year. It was so much effort, and it was you know this random bike ride. Like, why are you even doing this, disrupting your career? It wasn't until the last day of that trip, when I had that conversation with my son, that I realized what it was all about. That it was in this context of, what do you want to be when you grow up? And what I wanted to do in that phase of my life was to have a big adventure with my son, give him a book that was my gift to him. And by the way, I did the same thing a couple years later and gave a book to my daughter. So they've both gotten their legacy gifts. This is my Grand Canyon. This is my attempt to craft a meaningful life while I can, while I have this time, while I have this energy. Where do you want to orient it? And I could have focused it all on gaining material wealth, and instead I wanted to focus it on something that was much deeper and much more important to me. So your memories, think of it this way. Your memories in life are the highlights. It's not like the average of all your memories. When you look back, you're thinking about the highlights. So what can you do in your actions to increase the highlights in the next year? What are the highlights you're going to create? Whatever that looks like for you, focus on that memory creation. It's a way to generate vitality. So if you want more uh, from me, like my message, you can send me an email. Go to adventure, send it to email, adventurespeaker at gmail.com. Every quarter I send out uh, an, kind of a list of inspirations of people going beyond their perceived limits. I give keynotes and workshops, so if you like this message, just send me a note there. And I'm happy to come out and give a talk. I give talks all over to schools, to parent groups about raising resilient kids, to companies, to, at retreats, uh, keynotes, all kinds of stuff. I'm happy to give talks if you think this message is relevant. Those are the two books, Daunted Courage, which is the account of slight, retracing the Lewis and Clark Trail by bicycle with my two children, ages 12 and 6, Rising Sun, the one I just told you about, Cycling the Length of Japan with my son when he was 8. 
and then of course that group mentoring program. If you're interested in that, the first step is to fill out the questionnaire and then to set up a 30 minute call with me and we'll talk it through. At, at minimum, I'll just give you a diagnosis which has its own intrinsic value. You'll get feedback from all the conversations I've had with CEOs and I'll give you thoughts and specific things you can do. And then if you want to work together and join one of the, the group mentoring uh, workshops, then we can go to that next step. So ask yourself this. I'll close off with a couple questions I want you to ask yourself. First, what challenges excite and intimidate me? And remember, if it excites you, it is your authentic self asking to be expressed. And if it intimidates you, it is putting you in that space between your perceived and actual limits, this space that is full of growth and full of learning. That combination is magic. Go do it now. Make a list of those things and do it now. Then how can I periodize my work life? Don't make the rookie mistake of going hard all the time. This is the classic mistake I see over and over again. And you'll see it from old people who say, I wish I hadn't worked so much. They're not saying they wish they weren't professionally successful. We all want to be professionally successful. They're just saying, I wish I had put boundaries up so that I was also physically healthy, emotionally healthy, had vitality, and didn't just give it all to generating material wealth. That's appropriate boundary setting, and you can bring all of those together. So figure out how you're going to periodize your work life. And then how can you seek out growth through meaningful discomfort? Notice I qualified it by saying meaningful discomfort. You could take a hammer and whack yourself in the head over and over with it and you will be uncomfortable, but I don't know why you're doing that. That's kind of stupid. But if you are in discomfort because you are in pursuit of something that is your authentic calling, that is something difficult that you want to try to do and see if you can make it, man, that is beautiful discomfort. That's exactly the kind of discomfort you want. Figure out how to do that as many times as you can in your life in as many ways as possible. So I'll leave you with this final request. What are you waiting for? Go out and create your own adventure. So thank you very much. I hope this was interesting and useful to you, and I would be happy to take questions uh, if anyone has them, and I'll turn it over either to Andy or Kate for that process. Charles, I, Charles, I believe we have some questions in the questions in the chat. And okay. additionally, if you want to send over the request for time slots to me, please do so. And Charles, if there were a, uh, there was like, like an applause button on here, we could all be pushing it right now. And do me a Excellent. favor, if you would just put up your uh, slide that has your email address on it. Um, sure. All of our Petra team members, both internally and externally, believe in the power of appreciation. So I'm going to ask that everybody please go to your email and send uh, Charles a quick email of appreciation and how something from today's time spent impacted you, something that you're going to walk away with. And, how you're going to be impacted. So if you would do that message, uh, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, I loved your message on discomfort, the invitation to make a change and proactively go seek it out. Um, the, the, the piece about wealth and wealth being material, physical, emotional, and vitality and the, the kind of data that you gained there, I thought that was really, really good. Uh, and I loved your message on don't pick up your phone first. It'd be interesting to see how many people can actually do that. Uh, totally believe in that message. and. I'm going to have you back over to the house for dinner so you can tell my wife the exact same thing. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be careful. So there are a few questions in here. If you want to go through these, um, I assume you can see them. Uh, let's see. So hold on. I see. Okay. So David Frick has been very active in the question department. Okay. Let's see. So I see when you are. Hold on. Yeah, right. Actually, you know, would you do me a favor? Um, can, would you mind reading them out, sure. Andy? So David, David asked, uh, when you are a dictator or work with a dictator, how does how does one gently move someone from a dictator to a listener, or is it just time to move on? That is such a great question, uh, and I, I'm going to focus on uh, first yourself. If you're the dictator, I mean, this is why I liked um, you know Andy's book, uh, the forthcoming book is that um, this is something that we all have to learn uh, in our own way, the hard way. And I think what happens is it, it'll be relationship-based, right? Someone you care about, you'll watch the relationship fall apart, and then you get to go through that you know, process of evaluating, how, was it really their fault or was it my fault? And I think that's what often happens is you just, in the end, things don't work out the way you want them to work out. And that's how I think each of us kind of comes to that realization. And then others can help us. The people who love us are the ones who will give us the real blunt feedback you know, if, if, they, um, if they don't care about you, you're not going to really hear what they think. But, um, but if you're working with someone who's that way, the, I think the most important thing you can do is role model 
the way you want them to behave. So when they scream at you, when they publicly humiliate you, you don't scream back, you don't publicly humiliate them back. Think of yourself the way a parent does with a child. And I was, my wife and I often talk about this where we say, our job is to be the thermostat, not the thermometer, right? The thermostat sets the temperature. The thermometer reflects the temperature. So just because someone shoved you, you don't have to shove them back. You're, if you shove them back, you're now a thermometer reflecting the fact that someone just shoved you. If you're the thermostat, you behave in the way that you want the, your environment to be. So the, the more you're able to, to just behave that way, without saying a single word, that person will immediately recognize it's, it's almost a shame feeling that, wow, the, I, this person just role modeled how a mature adult would respond in this situation, and I just had, threw a temper tantrum. So I, to the degree that you can do it, uh, that's one thing. The second thing, you know, I grew up with some bullies, and what I learned with bullies is, is you, you cannot think like, or if you think like a victim, they don't stop. So if someone is bullying you, the dictator type role, please stand up for yourself. And it's best done in private, not in front of other people, because they're not going to be able to back down because they lose face. But take them in private and say, um, just, I will not be spoken to that way. I don't care about our hierarchical relationship. I simply will not be spoken to that way. I expect to be uh, spoken to with respect, and I will speak to you with respect. But I want to make that clear. And if they can't hear that, then you know, you're right. You may want to move on. But the key point is role model the behavior you want to receive from others, and it will start coming to you more and more, I think. Right, good answer. I love the second question. It's from Dylan. It says, how do we find our actual limitations? I think I viewed actual limitations as things that would kill me. <laughs> well, please don't. Okay, so yes, there, you know, implicit in everything I say is a certain amount of judgment. So please apply your mature judgment to whatever act you want to take on. So if the if your actual limit is oh I died so therefore this was my limit then please don't don't go that far. Of course, um, it's such a great question. What I think um, the exercise to do first of all and I put it in that questionnaire, write down what are your perceived limits. And as you see them written out, then you get to evaluate, is this really a limit, right, or not? And so one would be that I hear all the time, is like, I just don't have enough time in the day to get to everything. I don't have enough time in the day to exercise, for example. That'd be a really simple one. And that's not going to kill you when you find out that that's not a real limit. Um, the one that's, that I've experienced over and over again is the physical one where you just, you find out, for example, when I cycle over the mountains with my kids, you just find out there's a point at which your, your legs don't turn the pedals over anymore. So that's a physical one, like, oh. But then what happens is if you rest and you eat and drink a little bit, after a few minutes you recover, you can actually start pedaling again. And then there comes a point where you can't anymore. And then you rest and recover. So what you're really doing is you're learning about recovery and how recovery pushes you to be able to hit a limit and then bounce back from it, and then go again until you hit it. So the physical stuff is where it's most obvious. But, uh, but make your list. Make your list and just recognize where it, the perception itself is keeping you from doing something that you very well know you could do. It just might be hard. And then apply your judgment, please. Don't take this as an excuse to go do something foolhardy. I, I, I am anything but foolhardy. Everything I do is intentional and has a mitigation strategy associated with it and a lot of work that goes into it. It's not flippant decisions. Awesome. And that kind of leads to the last question on here. The periodization sounds great for training for tries or marathons, but how do you convince a CEO or stakeholder that less than stellar performance may be okay and a timeout to rebuild? So the, the, the meat of this is how do you convince someone that, that less than stellar performance may be okay and a timeout to rebuild is necessary? I would actually argue, or sorry, was it finished? Were you finished? Uh, pretty much, and, uh, and I think where you're going is these are two separate things. Yeah, um, so that the, the point, less than stellar performance, I, I kind of made a face when I heard that because that, that is not the point of periodization. The point is actually the opposite. Your performance should be better. You should have more stellar performance if you truly implement periodization techniques. I, remember the example is Meb, the guy who won the marathon, not the guy who got 25th. Right. So periodization as a concept leads to stellar performance. In the moment when you are having a recovery run, you are not performing in a stellar way. And this is the mistake. This is what I see the classic runner, like rookie runner mistake. Every run they're supposed to be, it's like it's the race. But that's a the, the race is the race. The, the training run is a training run. So understanding this distinction between stellar performance at all times, that's unrealistic. No human being 
performance at their peak at all times. We move through through this this cycle. So you have to be disciplined about identifying when is it that I want to perform at my max and when do I recover? And you build that into your day. And if your boss has a stereotype in his mind, the Superman stereotype, that there that we have no weaknesses, that's a problem because we all have our weaknesses. But it's not even weaknesses in the right word. We all have modes of recovery that lead to greater performance, that lead to the stellar performance. And along the way, it doesn't always look like stellar performance because that's not the way a, the cycle works. So, so in this case, I, this, what I do is I have this conversation with the CEOs. You make it an explicit topic and you, can, you don't have to use the term periodization if you don't want to, but I talk about uh, active recovery and how do you optimize performance so that you are beating your competition. And sometimes it's the opposite of what you might think. It's counterintuitive. And I'll just give one example. Is I have a friend who's, who's a lawyer, and she's exhausted from, from work. She works like these massive hours. And she got so fried and burnt out, she decided to take this yoga class, this yoga teacher training class on the weekends just to get away from work. So it was on Saturdays and Sundays, but it was literally just so she wouldn't work over the weekends. And she met two people in the class, just like her, professionals who were fried who needed some break from work. And guess what those two guys became? Her high-paying clients. Her yoga actually led her to bring two high-paying client, high clients to the firm by not working. It's counterintuitive. So her stellar, her performance improved by not working on the weekends, <laughs> right? So there's this, there's a lot going on here that's always available to you if you if you really pause and get away from the mindset of Superman facade. Yeah, and the equation the equation also has the, you know, the unfortunate piece of time, and we equate time. And performance the same, and it's not. You know, getting results does not mean long hours. It means doing the right work, not necessarily what's urgent. All those things that you talk about to get the ultimate outcome. So I appreciate the the insights there. Any yeah, last thoughts to add? I would just say that's the point. Is that um, uh, the marathon is obvious because it's a race in time, and the, there's a winner, so you know exactly re what your results are. Because at work, it's less obvious. I think many of us operate like every activity is the race, is the race, is the race, is the race. And understanding that's not the case and having quantified results, and this is why I think what you guys do in a Petra Coach is so important. When you're very clear on what your goals are and what your metrics are, you're measuring it, then that's what matters. Back out from how do you, you know, hit those metrics and do them in the most effective way. And active recovery and periodization will be the thing that allows you to hit those metrics. And that's what you measure, not the, the way you appear on every single day. Awesome. Nice. And I have the benefit of looking at your face, and you don't get to see mine, so I'm just like a voice in the clouds kind of talking to you right now. And I know how difficult it is to do this for 90 straight minutes without a lot of interaction with other people. You do a fantastic job. We as Petra and all of our members uh, really, really appreciate you being here today. So, Charles, anything we can do for you, please let us know. And we've got a little token in the on the way to you in the mail as well, something that you can enjoy while you're on a flight or on a bike ride. Well, uh, it was so. an honor. Yeah, thank right. you so much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. All right. Have a good one. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.